Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Door to Door. I'm Virginia Stanley, joined by my colleagues, Chris Connolly and Lainey Mays, the Library Love Fest team. And we have a really special episode for you today, because joining us today, author and editor, Wiley Cash, author, editor, David Highfell. And they're here today to talk to you and talk to each other. We're going to listen. Uh, about Wiley's forth forthcoming book, When Ghosts Come Home, uh, which is coming out in September. Uh, and we want you to send your questions in, put them in the chat box. What we'll do is have a, a conversation between David and Wiley for about a half hour, and then we'll go over to answer your questions. So uh, a brief introduction, Wiley Cash, hello. Wiley is the author of the award-winning and New York Times best-selling A Land More Kind Than Home. Uh, he's also uh, the acclaimed author of this, this Dark Road to Mercy and most recently, The Last Ballad. He's a winner and finalist for numerous prizes, two-time winner of the Southern Book Prize and a finalist for the Penn Robert Bingham Prize. He's the founder of the Open Canon Book Club and serves as a writer in residence at the University of North Carolina, Asheville. Uh, his new book, which I mentioned, When Ghosts Come Home, is on sale this September. So excited. Tense Thriller. It's about a drug-related murder and racial tensions on a coastal island off Wilmington, North Carolina. Uh, this is for fans of Greg Isles' issue-based atmospheric Southern crime novels. And speaking of Greg Isles, his editor, David Heifel. Hi, David. Hi. Hi. So David, uh, David's uh, the vice president and executive editor at William Morrow has been there for 15 years. And he is the editor of such blockbuster authors as Greg Isles, Patricia Cornwell, Peter Swanson, the fabulous Wiley Cash and others. Uh, uh, David was recently on our Facebook Live to talk with the authors L.R. Dorn uh, for their book, Anatomy of Desire, which is this very cool documentary style thriller, think serial and making of a murder. So if you haven't seen that, check it out. Um, but I wanna thank you both so much for taking the time to speak to each other, to us, to librarians, to talk about this amazing book, Wiley. So much excitement about this book. Librarians, as you know, are rabid fans of you and your writing. And so I can't thank you enough. And David, you are a treasure. As a, as a human being, I love you madly. Ditto as an editor. And so thank you gonna, so much. Yes, yes, yes. So we're gonna get right to it and, and hand it over to you. And again, please send in your questions. Uh, we'll have a few of our own, Chris and Lainey and I, but right now it's time to hear from author and editor, David Highfield Wiley Cash. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> so the, I think the first thing we wanna talk about really is without giving too much away, the, the, the bones of the book. The fun is in the reading, but it's nice to know a little bit of something, something. So we're gonna talk about a, li a little bit about the book. Wiley, I think you're gonna read a little, just a little bit so people get a sense of what that is. But also, you know, just the, the unique uh, relationship that you all have. Nobody has that relationship. It's mm -hmm. very unique and special. And you've, been, you've known each other for 11 years. And that says so much. You haven't hopped around while you're here. We're so fortunate to have you and to, and to be un, under David Highfield's wings. It's a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. Lucky. You're both so fortunate to know each other. And, and we are the, we're just as fortunate to have your beautiful books. So. Well, thank you, Virginia. I feel really fortunate too, to be with y'all and Chris and Lainey. Um, and I feel like I'm kind of a unicorn. I've had the same editor, the same publicist and the same agent and the same marketing team with both libraries and, and largely with sales since my first book was purchased way back in, I guess, 2010. So um, the support that y'all have given me uh, collectively as a publisher has been incredible. And and also with libraries, um, the support that librarians and, and libraries have given me, not just as a writer, but as a reader. Um, I know David may want to mention this as well, but you know, my support from libraries goes all the way back to growing up in Gastonia, North Carolina, which was not a bustling book town, if you could imagine. Um, we had like a, a bookstore in the mall that you know may, may not have stayed open for very long, but in my family, when you turn six years old, you got your own library card. 
And I can remember getting my library card. It was a, like a color of a manila envelope and it had a little metallic strip in it. And I remember, I, I can recall holding that and thinking, I will never be bored ever again. You know, if, if I can't play in the woods or I can't shoot basketball or um, whatever, I can always have a book and I will never be bored. And so I still go back to that library. Uh, it was foundational for me. I always go back when I have a book out. And now we're living in Wilmington, North Carolina. Shout out to our librarians, Kip and Laura. They've just been incredible supporters of, of my family and me. And I wrote much of the last ballad in the local library here because we were building a house and I didn't have anywhere else to go and libraries gave me a place to go. So thank you for, for serving me, for serving democracy as well uh, as community centers. But um, yeah, that's libraries have been foundational to me and, and David grew up in North Carolina as well. Yeah, my dad was a professor um, and my mom worked in state government. And I remember them taking me as a kid in the 60s and 70s and leaving me at the, the public library on Fayetteville Street in Raleigh, North Carolina. It was a different time. And I remember them leaving me there for an hour, hour and a half or more and thinking that was like going to the movies for me. That was like being considered a grown up and I could do what I wanted. I could get the book I wanted. I could, I could read Alistair McLean and Ian Fleming that my parents had no idea, you know, what it was, or I could read, you know, something more serious. But uh, anyway, libraries for me growing up were just incredibly important. And mm -hmm. maybe if I hadn't had that, I wouldn't be where I am today. So not forgotten and really treasured. Um, so maybe we should talk a little bit about the new book that we have. Oh, sorry, right there. Uh, the new book that we have coming out. So um, I'll say my setup, David, I'm kind of still learning how to talk about the book, uh, how, to, how to put it together and how to, how to kind of pitch it. But When Ghosts Come Home opens in the fall of 1984, uh, when a middle-aged sheriff on the coast of North Carolina is awakened in the middle of the night by the sound of an airplane passing low over his house and heading toward a small municipal landing strip in the middle of the night. And the sheriff knows that there is no good reason that uh, a plane of that size, he can feel how large it is, should be landing on this turf runway uh, in this sleepy coastal hamlet uh, in the middle of the night. So he goes out to check it out. What he finds at the end of this runway is an abandoned DC-3. It's an enormous airplane, much too large for this small airstrip. And it has crash landed on the runway. It's completely empty. Um, there is nothing inside of it. It has been abandoned and on the runway, Beside the aircraft is the body of a local man who's been shot dead and left behind just like the aircraft. And so after that, a mystery ensues. How did this airplane arrive? Who flew it? What was inside it? What is this local man's role, if anything, uh, in this crash? And the sheriff is facing more complications than just this mis murder investigation and this mysterious airplane. His daughter, um, she's in her mid-20s. She has returned home kind of trying to face and deal with this incredible grief in her life. And he's got several other complications. He's also in the midst of a re-election campaign, the, the, the election's coming up uh, the following week. And so he has all these pressures on him and, and all of these long, long buried ghosts begin to arise. Ghost of memory, ghost of race, ghost of family, ghost of responsibility, um, ghost of uncertainty and fear of making the wrong decision come to bear on him. Um, a very intense moment. So that is essentially the kind of long pitch of the book. But I know that uh, I left some things out. I don't know if David wanted to add anything. Well, one of the things I think of when we talk about your books, Wiley, is that I don't think of them as thrillers the way other people may. I mean, we use thriller as sort of a, a tag for these books, but I think of this as a sort of a crossover literary suspense novel, that it's not about the kind of fear the guy running with a gun down the street after, after our hero or heroine or something, it's really a more subtle novel of character. It doesn't mean it doesn't have a great story and it's emotionally rich and full and, and dramatic, but it's not a bad guys chasing somebody kind of book. It's, um, it's about mystery of character and about suspense of place and character as, as much as it is anything else. And I love that about your books and about the way family and past and 
relationships that we think of as being tangential sometimes, you know, bubble up and create um, great tension and the kind of things that, that um, drive smart fiction, what, whatever kind of novel it is. Um, tell us a little bit about Winston. He's a guy who, middle-aged, been doing this job as a sheriff for a while, though he's somewhat new in this town. Tell us about, you know, how you think of him and who he represents to you, kind of who he is and what he's doing in this book. <clears throat> you know, I, I like how you described what I'm trying to do in these books. And I think Winston as a character is, is emblematic of the characters that I'm trying to create. And those kinds of characters are characters that I don't get tired of spending time with. You know, I think every writer writes to their strengths. And I feel like my strength is character. You know, if I knew how to write a pulse pounding plot, believe me, I would. But David, I think you and I both know that that's not necessarily my strength. And, and oftentimes I get to a point in the novel where I'm so deep in character and I catch myself and think, wait, how's this gonna end? And I really have to sit with it and kind of comb back through these characters and look at all of their motivations and decide what's gonna happen next and how is this gonna come together to some kind of resolution, you know, which may or may not resolve all of the story, but perhaps some of the story. And Winston was one of those characters that I was able to spend a lot of time with. You know, he's from the western part of the state, so he's kind of an outsider, even though he's lived in this area for almost 20 years. Um, the, where the novel is set off the coast of Wilmington, North Carolina, it's a little island called Oak Island. And my family actually moved down there in 1998. And, and, in, and in many ways, they were fish out of water. It really took them a long time to understand the pace of island life, understand kind of the the history of the place and, and the social structure of the place and um, and all of that. And so Winston's a guy who, who in some ways has brought his past with him. He's brought some of the regrets that he, that he found himself uh, getting involved in back home in Gastonia, back where he's from in the Western part of the state. And, and, you know, they come back to haunt him. They come back to bear on his life here in, on the coast of North Carolina. And, He's a guy who cares deeply about his community. He's a, he's, a, he's a law officer who cares deeply about doing the right thing. But there are a couple of instances in the novel where he has to decide, is the ethical thing always the legal thing? And, and how do I differentiate between those two? And in terms of, of the legacy that I may leave behind to my family or, or of how people outside of my family are going to judge me, does it matter? You know? and, and he was a character that even until the very end of the novel, he was constantly surprising me. And, you know, I don't write quick novels. Um, and, and having a character like that with me, it makes the process of writing it feel less lonely because I feel like I'm with somebody that I'm trying to figure out, somebody who's always surprising me. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I love him and I, and I grew to love him even more through the process of your writing because you were sharing pieces as you were going along and trying to figure out kind of what was gonna happen. Um, anyway, you, you're raising those questions with me and wanting to talk about those things and the process is unusual. Um, and anyway, one scene that I love in the book and you and I've talked about this a lot is a scene where Winston as the sheriff um, sort of in the middle of the book and a young boy has been brought into um, the, um, his office um, and there's a question of whether he's going to be held or arrested or whatever um, and I believe it's that scene or one near, nearby where Winston has a conversation with his longtime secretary or the woman who kind of she's the receptionist maybe in the mm -hmm. sheriff's office and it's a really troubling poignant disturbing scene but it's a really quiet scene. Um, tell us about that scene without giving too much away. Can you tell us about that woman and how that conversation developed and, and what you think readers will feel when they read that? You know, that was um, the scene that you're talking about. The folks who have read this book early, whether it be family or friends or librarians that I've heard from, and I love hearing from librarians. You can email me through my website. Um, but that scene has stuck with people 
probably more than any other individual scene that people have talked about. And the setup for the scene is this. There is an incredible amount of racial tension in the community, not because of this murder, not because of this airplane, but because it has ignited memories of these long held tensions that have been simmering beneath the surface that have been, that, that white residents have been able to ignore, but that black residents are forced to live with every single day. It, it, uh, it calibrates their, the experience of their living in this community. And something happens in the novel where, where Winston the sheriff is really forced to step out of his comfort zone and confront um, these aggressive racialized tactics um, from, from members of the community. And there is, a, there is a disconnect between him and the secretary, this woman that he's known for almost two decades. And they see this racial aggression in very different ways. And it's revealed, the ways in which they see the world so differently is revealed in this very subtle interaction, this very subtle dance of a conversation where Winston knows that this woman he's known for almost two decades not only sees the world differently than he sees it, but almost lives in a completely different world than the world that he lives in. And the, in the novel, that it says something to the effect of a coldness sprang up between the two of them. It, it's as if there's, there had been this great silent upheaval that was going to condition forever after every single interaction and every intimacy of friendship or work life relationship these people were ever going to have. It, 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 it invariably changed their relationship. And, you know, I think the past five or so years for many of us, we continually found ourselves having these interactions where we're talking about something maybe political, maybe cultural, maybe social, um, and a line is breached or something happens and we say, oh my God, that's who you are. That's who you've always been and I didn't know. And I've given a piece of myself and my life to you. And, and I don't know if I would have given that to you had I known that you feel this way. And it's, it's a moment of grief, it's a moment of, of sadness, it's a moment of, um, of shock, and, 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 in some, and, and in some ways just horror that, you know, the ways that many of us can move through our lives without ever having that kind of thing revealed to us. And when it's revealed to the sheriff, for the first time in his life, perhaps, he sees what other folks in the community have to live with daily. He sees the attitudes that they are confronted with on a daily basis. And um, it restructures his understanding of that friendship, but it also restructures his understanding of his own role in the community. And he realizes for the first time, the hill he has to climb to get the work done that he wants to get done. Right, right. This is a, sort of in a similar vein, but another scene that I love Every time I read it, and I probably read it 15 times if I read it once, and that's the scene, I think it's in the headquarters in the sheriff's office as well with Ed Bellamy, who's the father, the grieving father of a young man who's died. And Ed Bellamy is black and a longtime member of this, this town and looking at Winston, the sheriff, as a, as a man he thinks can understand him, but yet still... He's not going to varnish or pretend that he's not incredibly angry and disappointed. And Winston is faced with this, you know, this man that he believes is telling him the truth and is someone, a man he wants to help, this father. But it is a wrenching kind of, again, very poignant moment. And it's you know, it's not a loud conversation. It's not incredibly dramatic that way, but it's, um, it's a very tender, um, emotional scene. Um, do you want to describe that a little bit? Sure. Yeah. I'm not, sure, sure. not sure what to ask you about it, but, um, but tell me how, 
how you came to that scene that those two men so um you know the man the man who's found dead on the runway his name is rodney bellamy he's a young man he's married he's just um he and his wife have just had a little boy and of course it's 1984 the war on drugs is going you know full speed we have the dare program where the officer comes to your elementary school and lets you see what crack cocaine looks like when you're in the third grade as if that's going to convince you not to drink your parents, you know, schnapps whenever they're out of town. Um, but all of the, we have all of these headwinds of, you know, outsiders and drugs and um, Willie Hortons and, and, and all of these things going on and coming to bear, especially on, on rural spaces, white rural spaces, um, which are not always white, certainly not in a place like North Carolina, but they're coming to bear on these uh, cultural and oftentimes economic conversations, certainly all political conversations. And, you know, all of these rumors spring up, like, well, there's this local guy on the runway who's dead and he happens to be black. So of course he was involved in this. And of course it was drugs. And of course it's the black community bringing drugs into the community. Well, this guy also, his father is a local de facto civil rights leader. He's the history teacher at the local high school. And he goes to the sheriff and he's like, look, man, my son wasn't involved in this. And, and I know you got to look into everybody, but you're wasting your time looking into him. And while you're doing this, here's what's happening in my community. Here's the reality of the, the, the racialized pressures that are coming to bear on my community that you have the privilege of being unaware of. And you need to respond to this instead of chase you know, my son's ghost, my innocent son's ghost, like, you need to deal with the here and now. And this is a grieving father, but he's also an angry father. And he is pushed to the brink where he kind of, in, in a roundabout way, tells Winston, you know, just so you know, I'm not going to deal with this anymore. Just so you know that 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 what's coming at me is going to be met at some point or another and and you can make it better or you can make it worse and i'm giving you an invitation to make it better because it's going to happen one way or another and so again you know winston who fancies them himself this open hearted open minded I would say the word progressive, but we weren't so much saying that in 1984, but somebody who believes in equality and believes in fair treatment and believes in justice for all really has to ask himself what that means. You know, he really has to ask himself, what is the right thing? What is the legal thing? Um, what serves the moment? What serves, you know, the community? Um, but that was, that was a delicate scene to write, but those are the kind of scenes that I like to write. I like to write scenes in which there are oppositional forces and there are subtextual meanings going on in conversations where, where there's, there's, there's a power exchange in play. Who's got the power? Who wants the power? What are they going to do with it if they get it? And, and those kind, I think of those things as these little, and I'm not a plot writer. I'm not, I'm not good at setting out a plot, but I think, you know, if I can, if I can write this scene and make it really tense, then that tension has to go somewhere. It's gonna leave the scene on a little trampoline and it's gonna bounce into the next chapter or the next section. And for me, that's as good as a plot domino hitting another plot domino. Because I can take that tension, I can take that discomfort, I can take that awkwardness and I can continue feeding the scene with it and feeding the character interactions with it much more naturally as a writer than I can um, plot uh, progression, which I'm, I, that's not my strength as a writer. It comes a little bit later for me, to be honest, but um, that scene, I think, uh, David, is a good example of kind of what I tried to do in nearly every scene of the novel, to be honest, not along the, that same theme, but even with family members or even with employees talking to one another or um, different, different scenes like that. This is a craft question, but tell people about how you how you write. And you're not someone who writes about the same character every time, the way some thriller suspense folks do. Um, 
and you you start with a relationship or with a situation, but you often kind of write a good bit of the novel before you really feel out what that plot is going to be. And you and I have conversations after you've written 100 pages and then after you've written 200 pages. And sometimes you you go in a different direction sometimes. It's just, it's so, I don't have that kind of conversation with many writers, but it, it's, it, it, it opens the door to, to me to kind of understand what you're doing and what questions you have and, and to hear what you want in, in a story, which is well, so much fun because anyway, I really enjoy it. Well, one thing I can say about how I write is I've been writing by, by longhand and this is the novel I'm work, working on right now. Page 20, David. 20 handwritten pages. Good I'm job, 20. I'm showing my homework. <laughs> um, but I wrote When Ghosts Come Home by hand as well. And I found that I can type faster than I can think, right? And so sometimes I would find myself typing ahead of my thoughts and sitting there and waiting for my thoughts to catch up. And for me as a writer, it was just torturous panic to see like, the cursor blinking and me not having the words to feed it. But when I'm handwriting, I write relatively, you know, it's, it, I write as fast as most, most people do, but it's not at the speed of my thinking really. And I, I, I realize that I can feed my, my words can feed my brain and vice versa when I'm, when I'm handwriting this stuff. Um, and so I do think long and hard about, about character, about scene dynamics over, you know, the ideas of plot and, and how the story is going to progress forward. Again, just because that's my, I feel like that's my strength as a writer. My, my strength as a writer is in these tight packets of scene, character interaction, dialogue, descriptions of settings, um, things like that. And then I have to look at what I've got at the end and say, okay, I have a general idea of how all these characters' impulses are going to come together to provide a lot of tension. And I need to find out where that tension goes. And oftentimes, you know, in working with you, I'll give you, you know, 20,000 words, 50,000 words, the whole novel. And we'll oftentimes have these conversations. And I can remember explicitly where I was. I remember um, when I was on tour for uh, the paperback of A Landmark Condon Home, I was in the guest room of my parents' best friends who were their maid of honor and best man at their wedding uh, on book tour, staying with them as a stopover in Charlotte. And uh, you were on, we were on the phone before an event. And you said, you know, I'm reading this and I see the kind of novel you're trying to write. I, I hear you saying what kind of novel you're trying to write. And I'm reading this novel over here. And here you are in your second novel. You need, you need to, this scene right here is going to decide for you what kind of writer you're going to be going for. And this scene here is going to decide the course of the novel. And that is going to come to bear on what you do next in your career. And I remember thinking like, oh my gosh, I've, I've never seen it that clearly. And the scene was, David, I don't know if you remember, but it was the scene of when um, Bobby Pruitt, the bounty hunter, goes and visits Wade's mom in this dark road to mercy. And there was some things that I was trying to do um, and it gave me pause. And when I pulled back and looked at it in the way you were asking me to look at it, the novel opened up in ways that felt larger, that the avenues that I could take felt a little larger and much less narrow, where I'm just gonna plot away trying to do these very fine things. And a similar thing happened um, in um, The Last Ballad, two moments in The Last Ballad. Um, and that was a novel that was torturous to write for many reasons. It was, it was a messy novel, it was a complex novel there were great upheavals in my personal life. We had a baby, I lost my dad. We had the 2016 election, which rocked the entire world. All of these things happened while I was working on this book. And I remember I was trying to stack these scenes on top of each other. And you said, I remember I was sitting on the front porch at our house, our old house. And you said, you said, sometimes the camera needs to pull back 
and the narrator needs to talk to the reader. And you need to find the narrative in this novel and what is the larger story of this novel aside from these scenes following one after the other. And you gave me some, some writers to read who you felt did that. And of course I went to our local library, uh, Myrtle Grove branch of the New Hanover County Public Library, um, which has since moved to Pine Valley. Uh, um, and I checked out the books that you suggested and being able to get a hold of that narrative thread apart from the scenes, apart from the characters, I was able to hold on to it like um, if I were a, a deep sea diver and I needed to be tethered to the boat to pull myself back up. And that's how I felt throughout the rest of the time that I was writing that book. And it really, it really led me. You have such a talent for getting at, getting toward the end and saying, okay, here's what we got. What are you gonna do with it? And, and kind of refocusing me. Um, and, and also just kind of believing it's, it's gonna work. <laughs> you know, even with the last ballad, my wife, Mallory was reading it and she would just read sections and she was like, what is this? What, what, you've got all these characters, you've got, you know, traveling religious figures in a mill strike novel. Um, you've got old ladies writing journals. What, what is this? And uh, I remember just feeling confident that we would figure out what it was by the end. And, and I think we did. I think uh, conceptually that book works because of that narrative thread. I agree. I agree. Well, you, you trust, you know, it's experience. You trust that I trust you, you trust me. And I know you can get there. If it takes a little longer, it doesn't matter really. You know, and people say, people say to me, where is the, where's the manuscript? They want to publish it, you know? It's in a certain slot in the in our schedule coming up, and we plan a year and a half away. And I'm just like, you know, part of lear learning to be an editor is saying it's just not ready. So it'll be ready soon. It's not ready yet. But um, well, even but with that's, the that's, landmark that's, that's the fun of saying we've worked together, and so my bosses know you, and my the marketing team knows you, and so we all trust that Wiley's going to pull it out, and he does. So you know, wow. yeah. Well, thank you I for think, doing that. I think that. What you both just said now speaks to, uh, as I was saying before, just this relationship that, you know, that is so um, singular and uh, unique and trusting. My God, I mean, as David said, now it's eleven years and a whole lot of wonderful books, and that's um, you know we could get into the nitty gritty of line line editing and all that stuff, but we know that's you know every every editor has their different way and every editor and author have their own relationship but hearing this and Wiley especially hearing from you like you remember where you were mm -hmm. and I don't know David if like if you even realized the impact of that moment on on Wiley but but clearly it uh it it packed uh, quite the the emotional punch and kind of scary too i would imagine sort of like where am i going with this now what's mm -hmm. going to happen next and it's going to define who you are as a writer going forward i mean that's it's a crazy amazing relationship built on trust i mean you also hear about editors and authors as you were saying before david you know that that you know don't stick together and here you are all these years later and all these fabulous books later and that says something about both of you. So I don't, I could listen to you guys forever. I do want to get to some of our questions. And then if there's anything else that you, you know, you want to, uh, you know, say or go back to some more questions and uh, there's so much there. Well, David, you were saying this is, there are so many um, advanced reviews, wonderful blurbs from fellow authors. And I was noticing that, um, we have beautiful reviews here, beautiful, just raves. And um, the one thing that, that keeps showing up in, in these, these lines of love for this book is how timely this book is. So it's, you know, it's set back uh, in the eighties, but it's, um, it's, it's just so, it's just so timely. And it, these are, these are lessons that need to be learned again and again, Lou Burney, I'm just going to read this quick and then I'm just going to go to questions, but Lou Burney, as we all know, author of November Road, among others, and he's just an amazing guy. 
It says, when ghosts come home as a gripping mystery, as complex and layered as the characters who inhabit it. Set in 1984, Wiley Cash's exploration of race, justice, and grief of the fault lines that rip apart families and communities could not be more timely. Uh, Deshaun Charles Winslow, author of in uh, West Mills, raves about it. Says this is a timely gem. Um, Lauren Wilkinson, author of Americans by the perfect novel for our present moment. I mean, there's this is the thread. This is, uh, and I'm just going to read one more because we love Kevin Wilson and. He clearly loves you. And when ghosts come home, while the cash reveals how family and history and the threads that connect us can contain such mystery. This is a masterful example of storytelling told by one of the most open-hearted and clear-eyed writers I know. Kevin Wilson, author of Nothing to See Here. Also an open-hearted and clear-eyed writer, I will say, because he's <laughs> amazing. Um, but, you know, just such lovely words from your fellow well, and, and can I can I can I say something, Virginia? It was, you know, I was I was so honored to have gotten as many blurbs as we did from writers that I genuinely adore their work, and and many of them I adore as as people because I know them a little bit. Um, but what I loved about this book more than um, some of the some of the other um, blurbs that I've gotten or the experience of getting the blurbs was that all of the responses came back and they said, you know, here's the blurb. And then nearly all of them would have comments to me about, I didn't see the ending coming um, and, and maybe some questions. And Kevin wrote um, that he was, he was really surprised by the ending. And he said, but it was, it was great because you came by it honestly. And I thought, oh my gosh, that's really such kind feedback. because. I've never written a novel that has kind of a surprise ending. Um, and this is, this is my first, I feel like this is my first real mystery. Um, before I've written novels where the reader has all the information and the mystery is going to be, when do the characters share all of the information with one another? But with this novel, the reader doesn't have it, it glean, the reader gleans the information as, as you go along. And uh, this, is, this is my first real mystery, I think. So the fact that Kevin said that and people were surprised by it, I found really, really touching and really honoring. Hopefully, Virginia, I think you're muted. Okay, sorry. I was trying to find my microphone button. I'm going to ask one question and then Chris and Lainey will, will divvy them up. But I want to get to this question from Janet Lockhart um, from North Carolina. She's in Raleigh, I think. Yeah. Yes. And we love her and she loves you. And so I'm going to jump right to her question and then we'll, we'll get back to the others. But she says, has Wiley Cash ever considered writing short stories? Love his novels, but I'm also a big fan of stories and think he would be a natural. There's a scene in this novel between Winston and a woman in the sheriff's office, um, stuck, um, in the sheriff's office named Vicki that almost read like a short story to me. So much conveyed in just a few pages. That's the scene that David was talking about earlier, the sheriff's interaction with, his, with the woman who works at the front desk. Um, thank you so much, Janet. Uh, I think one of the last times I saw Janet was on the escalator at BEA. She was going down one side and I was going up the other side and I looked at her and I was like, Janet? Um, but, you know, I have written some short stories. They're horrible. Uh, I published some short stories early on in my career and I published an excerpt of A Land More Kind Than Home as a short story. And that's how my agent, Nat Sobel, found me. It was published in a magazine um, called Crab Orchard Review. Um, I love reading short stories, but I'm, I'm just not a great short story writer. I think that, as I said before, you kind of write toward your, your abilities. And I love reading short stories. I love, I love studying short stories. Um, and I always think when I read a successful short story, I think, how would I have done this? And um, I tinker from time to time. I published a short story and um, a magazine that came out last year, um, but, you know, uh, Appalachian Review, but I, uh, I'm just not a great short story writer. I feel like I, I like the larger canvas and the larger character development 
Um, Cause short stories are such fine, delicate things with these fine points to them. And, um, you know, when I think of short stories, I think of masters like Daniel Evans or Ron Rash. I'm looking at my bookshelf right now. Um, but yeah, I love reading them, but thank you, Jan. And I wish I was better at writing them. Um, I want to ask this question from Maureen Roberts. So what does it mean? And close to, you know, interesting to make some another Southerner. We talked about that earlier, but what does it mean for you to be a Southern writer and how does that label make you feel? You know, I think it means a lot to me to be a writer, period. Um, I was thinking a lot about this, uh, and thank you for that question, Maureen. Um, but I was thinking a lot about this recently that, you know, I've been doing this, I'll have published four novels in nine years when this one comes out, and I never thought that would happen. And, you know, I, I do a lot of things to keep this going. I teach and I write. Dude, I do a lot of different stuff. And, um, but this is still going because of librarians and booksellers and readers, um, aside from the stuff that I'm doing. So the fact that I'm a writer, period, still seems new to me. It seems like something I should say in a whisper instead of out loud in case somebody hears it. Um, but to be a Southern writer, it, go, it goes both ways. And I mentioned Ron Rash earlier, Ron's talked about this. Um, that Southern writer is almost like you're a writer, but you're also Southern. So you're like, you know, stuck in this region in between Appalachia and Pennsylvania perhaps. Um, but I think that in terms of, of me being a Southern writer, I'm a Southern writer. Clyde Edgerton has a great, a great, a great quote that says, um, I'm a Southerner because I was born in the South. If I was born anywhere else, I would just be a human being. Um, and I think that being born in the South, it obviously gives me something to write about. It gives me a lens through which to see the world. But I hope that the issues that I'm, that I'm writing about, issues about family and social accountability, um, all these things, I, I think that these are relatively universal. And I, I hope that I'm just providing my own lens and turning it on to my small area of the country, but that anybody, no matter where they're from, whether it be Maine or Washington or, or California can look at it and say, look at one of my books and say, you know what, I felt like that. I, I felt like I didn't know the true character of someone I was close to. I know that feeling. And that happened to this sheriff in the, on the coast of North Carolina, but it also happened to me in Sacramento, California. I know what that feels like. And that's what I'm really interested in as a writer. Um, so I feel honored to be a writer. I feel honored to be a writer from the South, but I, I'm, 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 I'm most interested in, in, in creating those characters and putting them in scenarios that are familiar with readers no matter where they are. Excellent. Okay. And let's see here. We have a question from Marianne Casel Burke, who uh, says, hello from Northern New Jersey. Wiley, what is the hardest part of working with your editor? I just read the book on Max Perkins, had no idea of the process. The hardest part of working with my editor, honestly, not wanting to disappoint you, David. I mean, that's probably the hardest part. Um, not wanting to disappoint you either with um, my writing or anything. Um, I feel the great responsibility to um, your, his, your trust in me, the house's trust in me. Uh, Virginia and Laney and Chris are working um, to put books like this in librarians' hands. And so I feel a great sense of responsibility and I don't want, you know, nothing about this is, it, nothing about this is precious to me, right? Um, some people drill holes in sheet metal, I write by hand, right? Whatever, it, none, none of it is precious to me. None of it is provincial. None of it is, um, it's all work. And, I, and I, want, I want the work that I'm doing to honor the work that y'all are doing. I want those things to be, to, to feed one another. And that, that's the toughest thing about working with an editor for me. Um, but Marianne, I will say that that Max Perkins book is fantastic. I'm a big Thomas Wolfe fan. 
And uh, that Scott Berg book was, was a wonderfully written and an incredibly accurate portrait of the relationship that Wolf and, and Perkins had. But um, I, I will say that if you get a copy of the original version of Look Homeward Angel, which is titled O oh Lost, that University of South Carolina Press put out, I think in 2010, and you look at how much was cut from the opening pages of the Look Homeward Angel manuscript, it was some gorgeous, gorgeous writing. It's like a, like a novella unto itself. But, um, you know, David does a great job of allowing me the space and the time to make a mess of things and the guidance and the understanding to come in once I've messed up the room and say, this could be a great room. What's the centerpiece? And then we got to figure out what's, what do we want to show off in the room? What do we want to be the heart of the room? What do we want to be the, the theme of what, of what I'm trying to do? And so I feel really fortunate that way, but I'm constantly aware of the responsibility I have to, to David and to Virginia and to Lainey and to Chris and, 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 and other folks who, who are believing in this project. Mm -hmm. It's really wonderful. I want to read um, a message from Katie Stover in Kansas. So she said, do you remember that dinner where I read your tarot cards? I do remember that dinner. Yeah. I, and, and that's so funny you say that because um, I've been thinking about that. And I've been thinking about uh, another time when my tarot cards were, were read um, several years ago in New Hampshire. Uh, we had recently moved to the coast of North Carolina from West Virginia. And a woman read my tarot cards and she said, you've recently moved someplace and you're going to get to know that place by writing about it. And I thought, I will never write about Eastern North Carolina ever. It's not in me. The Western part of the state is in me, not, not Eastern North Carolina. And then, you know, we had two children here. My wife grew up in this area. My parents moved down here in 1998. And I've realized that if I'm going to understand something about my children who are going to have this place in them because they were born here. And I believe that that where you are born and where you are raised, not that it conditions you, but it certainly informs you in order to understand my children. I need to understand this place and, and writing about it. Let me understand it in a way that I wouldn't if I were just reading about it, or if I were just driving around inside of it. And so, yes, I remember the tarot cards and, and tarot cards, you would be happy to know, play a role in this novel as well. I love that. Um, yeah, do we wanna to go to the next question or? Okay. So we have one from Jennifer Winberry. Says your characters are so fully developed um, and still with me. Do any of them do anything that surprised you? And was there a character that you thought would play a minor role who demanded a larger role? That's a great question. And, and, and Jennifer's also uh, somebody who's given me incredible support with reviews, especially. So thank you so much for that, Jennifer. Um, you know, there are characters that surprise me. When I was writing A Land More Kind Than Home, um, Jimmy Hall, the grandfather, for a long time was a narrator. And um, I couldn't get him. And I wrote that book, all those, that, that novel was told in first person, all the characters spoke in first person, the narrative was in first person. And I couldn't get Jimmy Hall, who was kind of a mean old drunk who desperately wanted to be better. I couldn't get him to stop giving away the end of the book because the book's narrated in past tense. And I thought, in order for this man to feel real on the page, he can't narrate it because I can't, I can't have him be real and not be who I know him to be. And so I kept him as a character, but removed him as a narrator. And with Winston in this novel, uh, When Ghosts Come Home, I was continually surprised by him. You know, I started out thinking very clearly I knew who Winston was going to be. And then he kept surprising me and the novel kept surprising me and the relationships kept surprising me. 
And I never grew bored or too comfortable. I mean, even up until, you know, I think, I think David may know um, that he might not always tell David, like, there are 20 writers for you. There is one David for me. So please know that I always understand that. Uh, for, for Virginia and Laney and Chris, there's like 100 writers or, or more or 500 a season. There's there's one Virginia for me. There's only one Virginia for me. There's only one Wiley for oh, us. Oh, that's so kind. But um, <laughs> even at the very end of the revision, like last summer and into the early fall, Winston was still kind of making decisions that I thought, oh, are you sure? Are you sure you want to do this? Are you sure? this is how all of this is going to come together or not come together. And so Jennifer, you know, I, 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 you spend a lot of time with these people and they kind of become real to you, which makes you feel, makes you seem a little bit, you know, um, strange when you tell somebody that, but it makes it so, so much more sensible to spend time with them and to kind of watch them and, and to kind of find your way through their impulses when they feel that real to you. It's easier to write a book with people you believe in than, 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 than uh, chess pieces you're moving around the board. David, well, do you, do you, I'm just going to happen for one sec before Chris, you get to that next question, but I just wanted to get David back into that. How do you, how do you feel about what, what Wiley just said? Are you, you know, cause he, he was, Wiley was really brave because he was making some choices about what, about Winston and what he was going to be doing. And the end of the book, which is really, um, it's a big, it's a big ending. Um, and um, it, it, Wiley was very honest with me about, and himself about how he was going to do this and what, what the choices were. And they started at the beginning of the book, then went to the middle of the book and they affected the end of the book. And it was it was fascinating, and I think that you know Wiley's being very accurate about that, you know, but without giving too much away. But um, anyway, it was a. Uh, I've never been that close to a writer trying to figure out um, how he was going to, what decisions he was really going to be making about a character like Winston. Anyway, and I, it, was, I, it was great. I I loved I loved where it ended up and I and I but I, I feel like I never directed you Wiley I never said please do this and if you do this I'm gonna like scream if you do whatever I didn't I didn't that was there was none of that right I mean I was like you know just go do it and figure it out and we'll talk about it but you know no there was no there was no yelling or screaming but there was a moment where I sent you a draft and like you know stepped away and then I emailed you and was like don't open that don't read that what I just sent you that's not going to be the end that's not don't read that one and you were like so don't read this one I was like don't read that one whatever you do don't even don't even open it um because it was it was so fluid I mean and this was last summer I remember I was down in Beaufort South Carolina doing a doing a incredibly social distance event with the Pat Conroy Literary Center and I was in a hotel room with a broken air condition and like on a 95 degree day you know, trying to think about this novel and terrified that I was making the wrong decision. And, and um, I think then we like had set the pub date by then maybe. And we were like, we need to decide what happens at the end of this book. But you came across it organically. You, you, you made some decisions and tried it out and you changed some things, but you, you did it organically. It wasn't yeah. like, this is what has to happen. Map it out. Like it's sure. got to happen this way. That's yeah. not the way you write. I knew it was right because it surprised me. I, and then that, that made me know it was right. And I also knew it was right because I hadn't planned it. And, and, and that's when it really felt right. I agree. So David, did you open that or not? Well, I didn't open that version, but I knew kind of where he was going based on some conversations and other things I'd read. So I knew that that was a direction that he was um, struggling with. And I, I, you know, I was, I was, anyway, I, I don't want to give anything away, but let, <laughs> let's, say, let's say, you know, anyway, does, does that help? Mm -hmm. You know what? The fun is in the read. So, yes. Um, yes. So um, yeah, that, that, that's, that's fine. You've answered the question. Um, 
we have we're we have a few more minutes and Chris, I think you were going to ask a question from Janet and Ron Block, right? They're wanting to know. I just sent you a. Okay, let's see. Yeah, uh, and I think both are of a similar mind in that uh, you talked about authors that influence you, and I think people want to know what authors you might recommend for reading. Ron Block says, Wiley is such a huge supporter of other authors. Can you recommend a few must reads? Gosh, uh, I know Ron from the Cuyahoga County Library outside Cleveland, Ohio. Um, he has been very supportive of me as well. Um, authors that I think folks should read, you know, the book that, that we were talking about at the top of the show, uh, Anatomy of Desire, a new moral book. It's, it's structured like a podcast. It's a murder mystery of sorts. And, and what I love about it is it's a book that teaches you how to read it. And I uh, applaud both the bravery of the uh, authors and also the ability to influence the one dimensional page to the point where I feel like I'm listening to a podcast. It happens almost immediately where you're experiencing a podcast. So that's a book, um, I'm about 50 pages into that one. Um, I'm, a couple of books that I'm really, really excited about that I'm teaching this fall in my class at UNCA. Um, one is a novel, uh, a collection of essays called Aftershocks by a writer named Nadia Wusu. It's about her search for identity. She has kind of this multinational identity and she, she, she finds herself in America asking, you know, what do all these parts of my life uh, what do they make up of me? And, and, and she finds many of the answers to her own questions of identity and the literature that she's reading. It's just this beautiful conversation. Um, so that's a book that I've been really, really excited about. Um, another book, mm -hmm. if I may be so bold as to get up, um, is by my friend Ashley Bryant Phillips. Uh, this is put out by a small publisher in Spartanburg, South Carolina called Hub City Press. Um, it's called Sleepovers, a story collection from rural eastern North Carolina. This is a this is a really gorgeous book. And then my friend S.A. Cosby has a new novel coming out in a couple of weeks called Razorblade Suitcase, as does my friend Jason Mott, uh, just up the road here, has a new novel coming out called Hell of a Book. And it is a hell of a book. It is a gorgeous, haunting meditation on race and community and family and violence in the 21st century. So those are some books that I've read recently that I've been, that have, that have stayed with me and, and are staying with me. Wow, that's fantastic. That's, that's uh, those are some great uh, recommendations. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're starting to run out of time. So if we haven't answered your questions, um, Wiley is very active on Facebook. And so if you have any questions, that we haven't gotten to, please, Wiley, I'm sure that you will be more than happy to answer them mm -hmm. uh, on, um, on your Facebook page. I did want to ask you, Wiley, did you still want to just read that tiny little story? Oh, gosh, yes, yes. So I thought I would read uh, an, an excerpt that kind of sets up the, the tension for the novel. And um, this is the toward early on in the novel where the Sheriff Winston is out at the airport in the middle of the night. Um, he has discovered uh, the airplane at the end of the runway. And he's looking at it and he's wondering if, if there's somebody inside it. It's pitch black. He can hardly see. There's no lights out at the airport. Winston unholstered his pistol and stood with it down by his side. Hello, he called. He waited. But all he could hear was what seemed like the sharp, tinny silence of the airplane's presence. Anybody in there? He only raised his gun when the bouncing beam of a flashlight caught his eye. Someone was coming across the grassy field from the parking lot on his right. Winston turned in that direction, and that's when his eyes fell on the body of a black man lying on the grass alongside the runway. In the scattered beam of the approaching light, Winston saw that the front of the man's shirt had been blown wide open and his chest was dark and damp with blood. The man's eyes were open, but it was clear to Winston that he was dead. He trained his pistol on the approaching flashlight, and he wondered who had shot the man on the ground in front of him, wondered if that same person was approaching him now. He was surprised by the night's turn of events. 
But in that moment, nothing in him was scared. He was simply ready. And after my reading of that, let me say that the brilliant J.D. Jackson is doing the audio book. He most recently did the John Meacham book about John Lewis, Colson Whitehead's Nickel Boys, and the audio book is gorgeous. So check that out if you're if you're if your uh, patrons are into audio books. I want you to read the phone book to me. <laughs> well, we'll have J.D. Jackson doing the overdub. I'll move my mouth and we'll have him <laughs> actually doing it. Like, let's start with the A's, Virginia. <laughs> start with the A's. I want to end on this last comment. It's not a question, it's a comment by Rose Schmitz Marsen. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, so forgive me if I am not pronounced that correctly. Editors amaze me. They really are the hidden heroes of an author having a polished book. I want to give that nod to David Highfield because you really are such a special person. And this relationship that it's like, a, I kept thinking this is such like a brotherhood. It's so, you just have this connection, the two of you and this trust. That's what I, the word that just keeps coming back to me is trust. And knowing it's, David, like when you said, start out, you know, years, you've got, you know, years in, in advance. And then when it comes down to it, you know, when it's ready and when it's not ready and it's not ready till it's ready and you know that. Um, and just this understanding that the two of you have with each other is, um, it's sort of magical, I think. And, um, and I just wanna thank you, David, for, for taking the time to, to join this conversation because it's really, so, it's like no other. And Wiley, to have you here to talk about this journey and to this, you know, this really powerful book that uh, addresses things that um, topics and issues and community and family and the ghosts that we all have. Um, and whether the book is set in, you know, the 1980s or it's coming out in 2021, this is an important story. And uh, you've given it such, uh, as, as with all of your books, such thought and uh, grace. And um, we thank you so much for, we're so excited. I'm just so excited to have you here, to have this book coming out in September. I wish we could keep talking. Is there anything though you want to say before we go or Chris or Lainey, David, Wiley, anybody want to say anything? I mean, no one's going to shut down the internet <laughs> on talking, but people are, you know, working and whatnot. And so, well, I'll so say many again. people here. Well, I'll say again, Virginia, um, thank you to both Chris and Lainey and, and, and to David for, for putting this on for me and, and David for joining us. But thank you to librarians. You gave me a place to go when I was six. You gave me a place to go when I was, you know, how old I was writing Last Ballad. You give me a place to take my kids now. My daughter's six. Um, my, my oldest, my, my youngest is five. And the minute we could go back to our library, we did. and We love it. And um, Thank you for all the support. And, and if you ever want to get a hold of me, you can find me on Facebook, like Virginia said, or email me through my website. And uh, just, it's a hope it's okay that I mentioned, just be careful, uh, you know, be leaving uh, nice reviews on sites because I, I have a tendency to cold call librarians at their branches and, and thank them, which is always fun. It's kind of weird, but it's fun. I just want to say thanks for all the support. That's so lovely. And I think it's, you should see all the little hearts and the thumbs up that are floating up because people just- <laughs> That's probably all my mom. My mom's <laughs> found her way into the library chat. She's like, brilliant. On her, on her iPad with her cats wandering around. <laughs> Best novel ever, that's my son. Whenever I post something on social media, my mom talks to me in the third person. She's like, he is a great writer. I'm like, mom, this is me. Please stop talking to me in the third person as if I have a marketing company doing this. You know I don't. You know it's just me. You know I'm barely keeping it together. Don't make it seem bigger than it is. <laughs> I love that. Well, here's to barely keeping it together. You do that really well, Wiley. Well, thank you, Virginia. David, any last words from you, my friend? Well, just I want to echo what Wiley says about, you know, it takes a village, man. And we don't do this on our own. Yes, it's the best job in the world to be an editor, but I'm nothing without a good writer or a good marketing team and a publishing house and booksellers and yes, librarians. I mean, you know, this is a cultural thing, books and stories and 
great language. So, you know, I'm part of a team and I am enormously grateful to have this job and to work with colleagues like you. And I wish I had the chance to, like you, to meet librarians around the country. I would think there's nothing more fun than that. So yeah. um, anyway, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, and without librarians, they are the, you know, we, 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 we share our books with them and then they're the ones who turn around and have the masterful job Mm -hmm. of getting those books into readers who want to know what's the next best thing to, to read. What do I need to read? And um, what you need to read is When Ghosts Come Home by Wiley Cash. So um, with that, Chris, Lainey, um, there's the beautiful jacket. Just It's arresting. Do you love it, Wiley? I do, yeah. It took my breath away when I saw it. I've been very fortunate with my book jackets. Very fortunate. Mm, that's haunting, isn't it? Beautiful. Uh, Chris Laney, any last words? Thank you so much for this wonderful hour. Um, like she, Virginia said, there's so many hearts going up. You should see. They are wonderful questions too. And um, I know they enjoy you answering them for them. Well, thanks, Laney. Thank you, Wiley. Thank you, David. David and Wiley, they are the best. I'll talk. Yeah. Well, thanks, for, thanks for helping me get the stuff set up online too, Chris, as well small part to play anything I can do to help that's why we want everyone here to be able to see and uh, learn and listen to this wonderful conversation I know I adored this hour so and I'm no I'm not alone so thank you both of course. incredible so readers you can find the book there on uh NetGalley and Edelweiss I believe and um library and ALC the the advanced listener copy too they can listen oh that's oh, right oh my god thank you Lainey check that out so listen to it. So and I'm I doing did. some events with J.D. Jackson on book tour that'll be virtual. So okay. tune into those as well. And will those all be on your Facebook page? They will be and my website as well. We're going to have an audiobook author read off. Oh, that's cool. We're going to start with the A's, Virginia. Tune in. All right. I'll be there. Wiley, we go back, man. It's been a, it's been a lot of fun. And, it uh, has. It has. You're just lovely and um, so thrilled to see you again. Just so excited about this book. And how self-indulgent that my bookshelf only has my books on it. What it doesn't. You... I took the other books off. <laughs> I bet librarians are like, I thought he was a reader. Apparently he only reads his own books. <laughs> oh. They saw you get up and get the other book. There's another shelf. They just That's can't right. see it. That's true. That's, That's true. right, Lainey. Nice save. It was easy to grab it because it's the only one of mine <laughs> not on the shelf. I've heard great things about that book, Sleepovers. It's fantastic. It's, it's, it's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I can't remember where I read about it, but it sounded just absolutely wonderful. So, yeah, cool. Well, well, all right, thank everybody. You. Thank you so much. Thank you all. And go to Wiley's Facebook page. If you have questions that we haven't answered, go there. He'll answer them. And um, with, uh, I don't know, I think this has been just a fabulous hour and change. Thank you all so much for watching. And uh, we'll see you next week. So take good care. And Wiley, David, thank you again from the bottom of my hearts. Goodbye, Bye, everyone. Bye.